All right, guys, here we go. The only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Franklin Delano Roosevelt and the New Deal. Time for another video lecture. I need a shave. Sorry. Hair's a little shaggy. Sorry. I've been distracted by the Dodgers jersey in honor of them getting the National League West or getting their division, I should say. Here's my Dodger rally wall back here. Headlines, bobbleheads. You can dig it. I'm in baseball mode, but right now we need to talk about FDR. So let's begin by talking about FDR's relationship. They were fifth cousins by marriage to Theodore Roosevelt. Okay, um, obviously he knew Theodore Roosevelt. He he played cards with him. Um, he modeled himself in a lot of ways. His his behavior, his approach to politics in terms of trying to get into the game of politics, FDR used TR as as a model. It's a good model, right? Obviously a model of success. He went to Harvard like Roosevelt did. I think, you know, more because he could get in, not just because Teddy did it. Um, and he got married, you know, had kids. He's living his life. He's in politics. He's doing his thing. He gets polio contracts polio and loses the use of his legs when he's 39 years old, okay? Really bad move, or bad move, bad luck, really bad luck. He sinks into a depression for a year. This is the way he always told the story. This is the way Eleanor, his wife, always told the story. He sat in his office for a year and looked at the wall. No lights on, just depression city, right? Now, Probably not quite that much. I'm sure he left a couple of times here and there, you know, but a year. Eleanor Roosevelt always said that she felt that any man who had lost something that large, who had lost that much, deserved at least a year to have a pity party, right? To just to just tune out the world. And so she gave him a year. But then a year to the day after he'd gotten the news she came to him and she said, Franklin, your mind is perfectly fine. There's nothing wrong with your, with your intellect and your ability to speak, your, your brains, so your legs don't work. Okay, but so what? You can still do anything that you ever wanted to do. You can still succeed in politics. She, she rallied his spirits, and he always credited her with basically saving his life, reviving and resuscitating and kind of resurrecting not just his political glories, but his approach to life itself. So he got back into the game. A couple of years after that, he ran for the governorship of New York. He won. At the time that he becomes governor uh, in 1928, he... No, let me rephrase. I'm sorry. Shortly after he becomes governor in 1928, the Depression begins, and New York is one of the few states in the United States and the only state in the northeastern part of the country that actually gained population during the time of the Depression. The reason was FDR and his progressive government, FDR and his, the people that worked with him in his administration, they were so clever and so effective at coming up with policies to feed people, to employ people, to kind of help with the problems of the Depression, that lots of people moved to New York from Pennsylvania, from New Jersey, from Vermont, from New Hampshire, from all the states around New York, people left to go to New York because friends contacted them or they read it in the paper. Yeah, boy, New York, they're doing this, they're doing that. So he was this very successful governor at a time when the country was in a very bad place. And remember, whenever you make a big name for yourself in New York, like Theodore Roosevelt had a generation earlier, then people around the rest of the country, they start to know your name. Okay, so the election of 1932 rolls around and the Democrats decide to nominate Roosevelt to carry their flag forward to try to beat Herbert Hoover, right? Who was not exactly a popular president. You've been reading the book. You know that he had not done a very good job in terms of trying to fix the Depression, help, you know, not, not blaming Hoover. It wasn't his fault necessarily. He just didn't have the right temperament for things. The bottom line is that the Democrats decide to nominate FDR not because they think he's going to be a terrific leader, but because they think that he can get elected. He's a charming guy. He's got a panache. He's got style, even, even though his legs don't work, whether he's up on crutches or he's in the back of a car or he's sitting at a table. He's got a personality that works on people. Okay, they say, look, the guy, he's a lightweight. Intellectually, there's not much here. Okay, but 
he's going to get elected. He can win. He can beat Hoover. Maybe anybody can beat Hoover, but this guy could really beat Hoover, okay? And look, when he's president, Congress is going to run things. So we don't have anything to worry about. But yeah, FDR, that's the guy, okay? Now, what I always think is really ironic about this is that almost anyone will tell you, historians, anybody, that our two greatest presidents were Lincoln and Roosevelt, FDR. And ironically, both of those guys were given the nominations to run for the presidency by their party because their party thought they were electable, but not because the party thought that they were going to be particularly good presidents. And then, of course, they ended up being our two greatest presidents. So, again, ironic, right? Now, FDR gets the nomination from the Democrats. He becomes the first person in the history of the United States to give an acceptance speech at the convention. Okay, so he does this because he wants to show them that his health is good, that he can get up and get around, and he's not a cripple, that he's not handicapped. The other thing that's interesting about this, you know, is, is that Roosevelt oftentimes used his handicap to his advantage. Like, if he felt that he was going to be confronting a kind of hostile audience, he would insist upon walking out to the lectern or the podium to give the speech with his crutches and his legs braces on, and he'd fall down on purpose. And he was a great big guy. He was a big, well-built guy. So, bam, just like smash onto the stage. People, oh, my God, they run out, they get him up, they get him to the black turn. And then he would use these lines like, you know, I'm about as funny as a crutch. But, but you know, and the whole place would break up laughing, of course. And, you know, he'd sort of lighten the mood and he'd get them on his side right off the bat. Another one he liked to use is at the end of a speech or an appearance where he'd come out, you know, with his, like, braces and his crutches his, he would say, sorry, I have to run now, and he'd wave a crutch up in the air. And, you know, he was very clever about how to use his infirmity or his, his handicap or his disability in a way that would sort of, you know, uh, grab people and get them on his side. Now, when FDR made speeches talking about what he was going to do if he was elected president, he talked about the New Deal. This was a phrase that he had used as governor of New York here and there, but it was never the title of a, a platform to run for office. But now he's saying, if elected president of the United States, I'm going to give the American people a New Deal. It's time for a New Deal in this country. You know, and people would say, well, what is this New Deal? Anyhow, he never answered them. He was always able, because of the, his, the cleverness with which he sort of talked to people and was able to just kind of bob and weave. He was the consummate politician of the 20th century, he never once before the election actually spelled out specifically, number one, number two, three, what the New Deal was, what he was going to do. Now, in this day and age, you say, how could he possibly get elected president? Well, it was, it's not this day and age. It was a different time and place in history. And he was able to get away with this with kind of smoke and mirrors. After he got elected president, a reporter asked him, you know, why is it that you never really spelled out the New Deal and et cetera, you know, and Roosevelt said, because if I would have told the American people exactly what it was that I wanted to do, then I would never have been elected because they would have been too scared to give me the presidency because he wanted to change so much. He wanted to do such enormous things. In fact, oh no, never mind. <laughs> Forget in fact. Okay, so Roosevelt's elected. When Obama got elected, uh, he was compared to Roosevelt. I have it in the slide share. Here's a different cover of Time magazine showing Obama as FDR, the new New Deal, right? Over here, you see this political cartoon invoking the spirit of FDR. And you see Obama saying, I pledge you, I pledge myself to a 50-50, actually a so-so deal for the American people, not a new deal. And what he's got in his other hand is health care reform, right? Sort of alluding to the fact that FDR never really told people the enormity of what it was he was going to try to do. Nobody really knew exactly what was going to come with President Obama either, okay? Here's a famous picture of the cover of The New Yorker from March 4th, 1933. Hoover with this kind of stone face because he's been destroyed in the election. And then FDR just all fired up and then... There's actually a photo, you know, it's not quite so extreme in either direction, certainly not with FDR. But at any rate, he does win the election. It's the largest landslide in American history. It gives, F pardon me, it gives FDR a mandate for dramatic change. And in the first 100 days of his presidency, he was going to put into effect legislation that will begin 
the liberal transformation of the United States. And just to give you a sense, there's so many things we could talk about, but the impact of FDR, every president since him, Truman, Eisenhower, Kennedy, Johnson, Nixon, all the way up to Obama, what do they do 100 days after they have taken the oath of office? They go on television and they tell the American people, in 100 days, here is what I have accomplished. Everybody's got to do this because of what FDR did in the first 100 days. It's not like anyone expects another president to do quite so much, but nonetheless, it was a precedent that was established and it created a tradition. Okay, so Roosevelt's in, the election of 1932. The New Deal is underway. At his inauguration, Roosevelt says, I believe that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself, nameless, unreasoning terror. And I'm going to ask the, I'm going to ask the Congress for broad executive power in fact, the kind of power that I would be asking for if we were being invaded by a foreign enemy. Okay, so he's saying, look, if you want me to get the job done here, then I've got to have a tremendous amount of power as president to get the job done. Well, what is it that Roosevelt intends to do? Here's the cover of Collier's Magazine, March of 1933. What is it that he intends to do? Well, he's going to do a lot of things, but the first thing that he does is he orders that there's going to be a holiday, a banking holiday. Every bank in the country is going to close for a few days. After he announces this, this is the first day of his presidency, he goes down to Congress to talk to them about the Emergency Banking Act. Okay, now usually when the president wants to talk to Congress about something he wants to get done, three, five, eight, ten, fifteen members of Congress come up to the White House to talk to the president. But this is an extreme time. Right? The 24% the unemployment, the country is being flushed down the toilet. So FDR goes to Congress to plead in person with the members of Congress. You've got to let me do this. Okay? And then, after he tells them what this is, he goes on the radio that night and conducts the first fireside chat. Okay? Now, here you have a couple of photos. The American people receiving the fireside chats. Over 60 million people tuned into the first of the chats, roughly half of the population of the country at that time. The next day, a sign was mounted on the wall of Thomas Edison Incorporated, which read, President Roosevelt has done his part. Now you do something. Buy something. Buy anything. Anywhere. Paint your kitchen. Send a telegram. Give a party. Get a car. Pay a bill. Run a flat. Fix your roof. Get a haircut. See a show. Build a house. Take a trip. Sing a song. Get married. It doesn't matter what you do, but get going and keep going. This old world is starting to move. Okay? Now, what is it that Roosevelt does in the first of these fireside chats? There's going to be 30 of them between 1933 and 1944. 30 different times where President Roosevelt went on the radio in a you know nationally notified kind of moment. Hey, the whole country knows FDR is going to be on tonight. 30 excuse me, 30 different times where he went on the radio to talk to the American people about something that was of the utmost importance, something that he wanted to present directly to them with nothing between him and them but the microphone or the radio speaker, right? Okay, so Roosevelt goes on the radio that night, and the first thing he does is he establishes a scene. He creates a moment. He says, I'm paraphrasing here, but he says, Good evening, my fellow Americans. This is Franklin Roosevelt, your president, speaking to you from the White House. My wife, Eleanor, and I have just finished dinner, and Eleanor is here knitting some baby booties for our grandson, John. Our little dog, Fala, is by the fire, chewing a rubber ball. But I'm going to take a moment here after the dinner hour to speak to you about the issue of banking. And off he goes to tell them stuff that they never really heard of, most of them, or understood, or about banking. Okay, but what's important... First of all, is what he just did. He created a scene. Here we are, after dinner, sitting here by the fireplace, right? My wife's knitting some booties, and I'm just talking to you. I'm in the rocking chair or whatever. Here's the dog. Okay, well, as he says this, people look around, and they look at these images, right? And they look at themselves at the room that they're in. And they say, well, they're just like us, the Roosevelt's, the, the, the people. I mean, we just had dinner. We're sitting here by the fire. 
there's the dog, there's Grandma, right, knitting a pair of booties or whatever. Why were they called the Fireside Chats? At this time in American history, 1933, only half of American homes had electricity. In the rest of American homes, if you wanted some light when the sun went down, you lit candles, you lit lanterns. Mostly what you did is you stoked a fire in the fireplace, and that only made, not only made the house warm, it lit up an area in the front room, which was called the Fireside. And you could read there. You know, Abe Lincoln doing his homework back in the day. You know, the family would gather around the fireside, particularly in the winter when it was cold. Okay? So what Roosevelt does in the first 30 seconds of the first fireside chat is something that Herbert Hoover had not been able to do in four years or three years as president during the Depression. He connected to people. He reached through the radio and touched the heart of every American listening to him in a human way, right? Okay, so he makes this connection. He says, right, here's what we're going to do. He says, look, banks are the backbone, the foundation of American greatness. We must have banks. I know that many of you lost a lot of money in the banking crash, and I know that most of you are not too crazy about banks right now, but let me explain banking to you. And what he does, basically, is he gives the American people a kind of banking 101, banking for dummies. He tells them, he says, look, when you go put your money in the bank, in a checking account or a savings account, the bank doesn't take that money and put it in a Ziploc bag and with a magic marker write your name on it and stick it in a drawer until you come back for it. They use that money to extend loans and lines of credit and to, and to invest in things and to stimulate economic growth, which creates jobs, which creates production, which creates tax dollars, which is, this is the heart, the living, breathing heart of the American experience, capitalism, right? So he says, you've got to trust banks. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to examine all these banks. We're closing them down, and then we're going to examine them. Or federal investigators are going to go and look at their paperwork, at their books, at their records. And then what we're going to do is we're going to classify, we're going to divide all the banks into three categories. Sound or healthy, unsound, unhealthy, or oh, pardon me, sound, reasonably sound, kind of healthy, unsound, unhealthy. The sound banks are going to open up very quickly. After a period of time, after we straighten out their management, maybe put new people in charge, clear up the way they're doing things, the reasonably sound banks are going to reopen. Some of the unsound banks, even some of them will open. It'll take longer, but some of them, we're not going to reopen at all because we're just, it's going to have been determined that they just, they were doing business in too slipshod a manner. They're not responsible. We can't entrust them with the money, with the, with the hard-earned money of the American people. So some banks are never going to open up again. But what the president says is this. He says, when a bank opens in your part of town, I don't care if it was your bank before the crash, it's just a bank. I don't want you to go down there, especially if it was your bank, you know, and try to get your money out. Whatever money you have lost, I'm sorry, but it's gone. I want you to go down to the bank. I want you to take your money and I want you to open up an account at that bank. Put your money in the bank. Now believe me, at this moment, 60 million people, they all look at each other like, he must be crazy. But he knows that they're doing that. And he says, listen, I know that you've got some money socked away for the rainiest day, the worst day. You, it's in the cookie jar on the top shelf, or it's buried under a hollow log in the backyard, or it's under your mattress, or it's in the cigar box down where you've got some money, okay? I need you to trust me and to trust America and to believe in our future. I need you to go put your money in the bank. You have to do this. Help me to save the American way of life. Okay, now he goes into a lot of other stuff in connection with this, but that's the essence of it. And then finally he's done. He says, okay, so long. i got to get you know, some sleep and bye. I'll talk to you later. Whatever. He's out. People look at each other. What? Okay. Well, the banks close. And they're closed. Four days minimum. Some of them are closed longer. Some of them even longer. But the bottom line is this. When the banks reopened, people went down and put their money in the bank. And even more miracul miraculously than that, is over half a million people sent their money to the president. Whatever they had, a nickel, two dollars, five dollars, ten dollars, fifty, a hundred, whatever, 
They put it in an envelope. They wrote a note, Dear Mr. President, I think that you're the best thing that ever happened to this country. Please use this $3.65. Yours truly, Emma Shepard, or whatever. They wrote him a note. They thanked him. They told him they loved him. They wished him luck. They sent him money. They didn't even know what the address was most of the time. They just wrote on the envelope, The White House, hurry, rush it, you know, or President Roosevelt, Washington, D.C., and chucked it in the mailbox with a stamp. They just wanted the president to get the money because they believed that he was going to know the right thing to do with it to help the country. What a moment, right? And the thing is, it worked. Banking was saved. And when you go back and you look at the newspaper headlines and the magazine articles and you, and you read the transcripts of the radio addresses that were made in the next, the next day, in the next two days, three days, week, over and over and over, you see the same kind of language being used, the same metaphors, the same turns of phrase. It was as if the clouds finally opened and the light came through. It felt as though after a long journey through a dark and dismal tunnel, we could see a light growing. The end of the tunnel was approaching. It was as if we had been standing at the edge of a precipice or a cliff for so long. And then finally we took a great step back and we knew that we would fall no more. Over and over, people are using this language, suggesting that in just this one moment, Roosevelt had somehow pulled the country in the right direction, gave people a sense of hope that things could get better. Yeah, it was an amazing moment, okay? And it worked. Like I said, American banking was saved in a day, is the, the famous old line about it, okay? Now, let's talk about, there's a couple of cool, you know, uh, political cartoons, right? If I were over here on my right, uh, the March lion, you know, that they always say March comes in like a lion and goes out like a lamb because it's always really stormy at the beginning of March and then it mellows out by the end of the month. And so here's the result saying, you're going out like a lamb, goddammit, to the financial crisis, right, which is a lion. Over here on the far left, you see the government. Basically, it's Congress chopping down trees, right? And Roosevelt, the president, saying, keep up the good work, right? Because they're chopping at the economy, at the banking crisis, all these different things. And then he's saying, hey, chop down the rest of your bank reform and farm relief. We need all these things taken care of. You know, keep going, right? And in the middle, you see this hand of cards, right? It is a new deal. The protection of the gold standard, the bank holiday, the budget message, the inaugural address when he uttered that great line, we have nothing to fear but fear itself, bank legislation, whatever, etc., so you get the sense that people are responding to this, okay? And I will come back to that in a minute. But when Roosevelt talked about the New Deal early on in his presidency, he talked about the three R's, three words, beginning with the letter R. And when you take them in a certain order, it creates a kind of program or an approach for dealing with the Depression. So what are the words? You tell me, guys, think for a minute. Three words that begin with R that are positive, that are optimistic, that suggest that things are going to be fixed. Repair work, reconstruction, retrofitting, renewal, restoration, none of that. Okay, the three R's go like so. Relief, recovery, and reform. Relief means... To ease the pain, ease the suffering, help people out very quickly just to kind of get stabilized. So everybody's got three meals a day and people are being taken care of and sort of help to just not feel so bad anymore, okay? And then recovery means getting the country back up on its feet, man. Banking on its feet, industry, farming, right? Fixing all of these things that have, that have broken, that have gone wrong. And then finally, reform. Reform the American system, change the old ways into new ways, so that nothing like this ever happens again. Now, some of you may be thinking back to the recent financial crisis, right, since President Obama was elected last year of George W. Bush's second term, but you know what I'm talking about. You're saying, but it did happen again. Well, not really. I mean, yeah, it was kind of like the Second Depression, or we're probably going to end up calling it the Great Recession. But guys, during the Depression, unemployment never got under 17, 16, 17 percent. And it was at 23, 24 percent for a couple of years. Okay? During our last financial crisis, it, at its worst, I think unemployment was 10 percent. 
Not 16, 17, 24? No. Okay, so, almost 100 years ago now, 80 years back, the New Deal began the transformation, the liberal transformation of the old United States into a new United States. Okay, now, how is that going to be affected? Well, we'll talk about that stuff in the next video.